Um, yes, I will um, give a short presentation about living horsepower, how we try to match um, yeah, the living horsepower to machinery or mechanical implements and keeping the animal welfare in, in mind. And um, a short introduction about myself. I'm a mechanical engineer and uh, work as a teacher for mechanics and environmental science at the high school in Ettelbrück, Luxembourg. And besides that, I run a small farm in Western Luxembourg, mainly consisting of grassland, uh, but also a few hectares of arable land and the garden and the small forest where we produce our own uh, firewood. And um, I chair the NGO Schaffmatt Pert since 2013 when it was founded. And finally, I'm also author in um, two magazines, a small farmer's journal from USA, USA and Moderna Hescraft are from Sweden, which means uh, modern horsepower. Um, yeah, the content of my presentation is um, we will talk a little bit about horsepower or what we understand under um, horsepower. We will talk about uh, possible draft forces of our workhorses, about uh, balancing forces in a hitch and uh, does and don't, so things to, to avoid or to, to do in a, in a hitch. Um, most of the time when we speak about the draft capabilities of horses, and you can also find um, very often in, uh, in literature a value which says that you, a horse can pull 10 to 15 percent of its own body weight. Um, I personally am not very happy with this value because it doesn't take in mind that um, there's a difference between trained and untrained horses. And it doesn't take into consideration if it is a short time or a long time effort. Um, the picture which you can see on the left uh, side of this slide was made exactly a year ago in November 21 in Sweden, when we did uh, measure the efficiency of a three or hitch on the logging wagon. And we found out that um, the average horsepower of this hitch was about uh, 5.6 horsepower. So each of the horses did perform a little bit more than uh, one horsepower. But um, as I said before, you have to keep in mind that these horses were professionally used horses, daily used horses. Uh, completely trained, completely fit, and that they have the time to rest during the loading and unloading of this um, wagon. Um, so it's not the right way if we compare these values, for example, with uh, tillage work or plowing work, where the horses have to perform a constant uh, effort. And um, most of the time, we compare our horses, our workhorses with tractors, and we claim that we are completely eco-friendly um, and more efficient. But the real alternative to our workhorses um, can be seen here. These are the small two-wheel tractors or motor cultivators. Um, and why is that? Because they use the same tools as we use. If you look at the seeding units at the rear of this uh, two-wheel tractor, uh, we use exactly the same tools on our implements. Uh, here you can see this tool carrier, which I presented already this morning. Um, and uh, out of these uh, two-wheel tractors, every characteristic, technical characteristic is known. And if you ask around about the horse's uh, real horsepower, um, 
it's not so clear for many uh, horse owners how much power they they really have and um yeah here you can see the same tool carrier is uh, cultivating tines and um another concurrence for or alternative for our workhorses um can be seen here here you have um, a wheeled cultivator designed for a pair hitch and a few years ago uh, we did try on request of a company from austria the same implement on an electric driven vehicle uh, originally this vehicle was designed as a pure fun vehicle but this company tried also to get a um, a foothold in the, in the working area, mainly in vineyards. So they asked us to, to try a little bit um, uh, our implements. And again, out of these implements or these pulling vehicles, you know every characteristic, um, but not um, of our horses. So what we need uh, for the future is data. Data out of our horses. And um, we still believe, after having done now about 11 years of measurings, uh, doing a lot of field tests a little bit all around of Europe, uh, we still believe in the values of uh, James Watt, who we'll go back in the 18th century. Um, and James Watt uh, claims that a horse can pull 75 kilogram on a height of one meter in one second. That's what defines uh, one horsepower. And that's still our value. The load in the traces um, for a long time effort should not be um, above 75 kilogram. And um, another thing I want to, to highlight is that in our opinion, a horse um, should only pull that's the reason why we call them also draft horses. Um, and it should not uh, carry any load on his back and it should not carry any load on his collar um, or his neck because um, when you put additional load, uh, vertical loads on his back or his neck, you lower uh, the possible um, draft force. Um, as it's uh, yeah, a living being and not a machinery. And um, here's just an example how in our eyes a modern uh, hitch can look. You see that the shafts are spring suspended. So we take off any load of the horse's back and the horse does only one thing. It simply pulls and uh, does not carry um, any load and on the back of the horse you can also see our data logger where we measure the draft forces or the support forces on the, the horse's back um, and out of this value of one horsepower we have um, defined five um, load classifications for classifying our implements and uh, that goes from a very light work of about 0.2 kilonewtons, which correspond to a load of about 20 kilogram in the traces, up to uh, 1.0 kilonewton corresponding of about uh, 100 kilogram, which is already a very heavy work, so comparable to, to forest work or logging uh, under heavy conditions. Um, and um, when speaking to the about the draft force, we have to keep in mind that we have to deal with uh, biological systems. A horse is not a machinery, as I said before, and that's a mistake which is uh, very often done that people compare our draft forces with machinery and think that they have to, to work as a machinery. And um, we have to keep in mind that uh, 
most of the work which has been done in the past years are just field trials. And um, what I said also this morning, we have to find ways to get our work on a scientific level and to, to do some real uh, scientific research about um, what our horse can perform. Um, this picture on the right side was made during our first workshop uh, within this LIDA project, end of May, in the south of Sweden. And what we did there was comparing a two-horse hitch versus a three-horse hitch on the same implement. It was an, an Amish-built um, mowing machine, sickle bar mowing machine coming from the US. And um, we did all, here's a picture how the measuring setup was made. You can see four sensors on the single trees, and we had also four sensors on the, the evener. And we tried to find out how equally the horses were balanced. Um, you see the yellow line um, that was a draft was of the left uh, side of the horse, and the green line was of the horse walking on the right side. And you can see that both of the horses were perfectly balanced. And when you look into literature, it's also very common um, that you can read about the loss of efficiency if you go from one horse hitch to a two horse or a pair hitch. But we could not prove these values. But again, we have to, to repeat these measurements and um, to put it on a scientific level. Um, because we also try to, to find out the best hitch position on this mowing machine. As you can see here, the chain going back from the evener to the mowing machine can be hitched in three different positions. And after analyzing these values, we thought that we have found out the good position, but we repeated these um, measurements in September during a horse day uh, organized in Western Sweden with the same mowing machine, but other horses. And we found out completely the opposite results. And uh, so again, if we want to, yeah, to find out what really happens in the horse hitch, we, we have to, to improve our measurement. Uh, or testing um, procedures. And um, the only thing what we know for sure is what has been found already in mid of the last century, that the force, the draft force of a horse is highly oscillating. It's not a constant force, it's really highly oscillating. That's a graph published mid of the last century by a German agriculture machinery ma manufacturer called FAR. Um, and currently we are also trying to find out ways by using draft springs and other hitch devices to, to lower a little bit these oscillations also in relation to, to animal welfare. Um, yes. Um, a very important research project is currently under application. We expect an answer within the next two weeks from the Swedish, uh, from the Swedish Foundation for Sustainable Development called FORMAS. And we introduced in the beginning of this year a research project uh, for measuring the draft forces of the three Swedish workhorse breeds. It's a North Swedish horse, the Swedish Ardenna and the Gotland uh, Ross Pony. And our plan is to measure over the next three years uh, 150 workhorses under load. And um, our part in this research project is a project in cooperation with the Swedish University for uh, Agrarian Science in Uppsala is to develop this dynamometer to, to have a variable load. And um, I really put some hope in this project um, that uh, at least in three, four years, 
we have better values and uh, better knowledge how a horse is pull um, as we have now. Um, yes, balancing forces is also a very important issue. Most of the time neglected by a lot of horse users. Um, and I will present you a little bit uh, our experience about load centers and also about um, parasitic forces. Parasitic forces are forces in a hitch which don't help you uh, to get your work or tasks done, but uh, which put some additional load on the horse. And um, when we look to this picture, uh, you see a walking plow as it was used uh, for, for centuries with draft animals. And you see a perfectly balanced hitch because the line of draft is going from the horse's shoulders, from the collar resting on the horse's shoulders, uh, through the center of gravity of the horse down to the load center of the plowshare. And that's how a perfectly balanced hitch has to, to be. And when we look on the first tractors which came up, in the beginning of the last century, uh, it was the same uh, for the simple reason um, because the first tractors were nothing else than a copy of a horse hitch. They had no three point link, they had a simple drawbar, the implements were hitched to this drawbar, and they did nothing else than copying the horse hitches. But this changed uh, dramatically when the three-point link was invented by the Irishman Harry Ferguson. And as you can see here, you don't have anymore this true and simple line of draft, but you get uh, what we call an instantaneous pole. And this um, center is varying uh, with um, each position of the implement. Nowadays, when you look on big farming uh, activities and big farm machinery, most of the time, tractors are balanced with heavy front weight up to three tons. And that's nothing else than a dead weight. You pull a lot of weight of dead weight around uh, for balancing your tractor, which helps nothing um, to the work. And that's something we have to avoid in our horse hitches um, that we pull so much uh, unneeded weight around. Um, here's a picture how it looks in reality. You have again, uh, that's one of uh, my horses, uh, a sweet Jardana. Um, and you see the line of draft going uh, from a 90 degree angle on the horse's shoulders down to the implement and uh, it matches the load center of the implement. And um, here's another example on a roller. The roller, uh, roller's load center can be found in the center of the axle. So when the line of draft is going through this load center, you perfectly balance again your hitch and you don't put any additional load on the horse's back. Um, yeah, very often forecarts are considered as a modern approach to, to, to farming with horses. Um, and the problem is when you put uh, an implement to the rear of a forecart, it um, tends to lift the front of the tongue where the forecart is attached to the horse. And for counterbalancing this effect, most of the forecarts are very heavy at the front. So again, you have these parasitic forces in the hitch who put some strain on the horse, but don't um, help you uh, perform your work. And um, again, here you can see that the line of draft is not going through the uh, wheel center. And um, 
So the horse itself lifts the front. And again, for counterbalancing, we usually put a lot of weight at the front. And if um, the men on the forehand stand up, what you can see very often, regretfully, you put again some extra load on the horse's um, collar. And um, that's the things um, yeah, you should avoid in a, a balanced hitch. And um, yeah, here you can see the load center. And when we look uh, from the top view on a, a horse-drawn forecard, we can see if we hit with one of the wheel, uh, let's say a stone on the ground or another sort of obstacle, that creates some lateral forces on the tongue, which also puts some, some strain on the horse's necks. And um, also the, the movement of the tongue uh, of the implement uh, creates some, some movement on the tongue. So we again uh, put um, some additional load on the horses. And um, yeah, here you can see again the load center. And this hitch is again not balanced because none of the horses is going through this load center. Um, and it was more or less by chance that I found out a few years ago um, when I did pull uh, my wheelbarrow around um, for marking out our stable, how easy it is when you drive it with a single wheel forecart and how heavy it gets when you repeat the same exercise with a two wheel uh, for, um, wheelbarrow. And um, the reason is quite simple. Um, on the single wheel uh, wheelbarrow, um, the line where you are walking and pushing it uh, goes exactly through the wheel of the wheelbarrow. So you are perfectly balanced again. And this is not true on, uh, on the two wheel uh, wheelbarrow. And um, yeah, some words about uh, dos and don'ts. Um, a common mistake in our eyes is that we adapt too much tractor equipment to our horses. Um, what does that mean? Um, well, if we let our horses pull tractor implement, we pull most of the time equipment which is built far too heavy because it is built for higher speeds and higher forces. So, um, Again, it's inefficient. And another common mistake is that we let our horses pull uh, equipment originally built for being used with ATVs or quads, because on these uh, implements, the wheels are most of the time uh, too small. And um, on this picture, you can see two different hay rakes. I make I made this picture in 2012 when we organized a workshop in northern Italy on a farm in the hilly areas around Bologna. Uh, it's a dairy farmer. And um, on the left side of the picture, you can see uh, a hay rake, which is an original tractor. Uh, equipment and on the right side you see an old hay rake ground driven um, and you can still find this type of implements on nearly every farm in, in northern Italy because they are very yeah very famous and widespread in northern Italy and you can see the shafts on the uh, horse drawn implement it's a single horse um, implement and uh, originally tractor driven hay rake has to be pulled by a three horse hitch and um, four cart equipped with a um, donkey engine a combustion engine of about uh, 21 horsepower and i have my doubts about um, if we claim that we are modern and um, yeah progressive if we 
let um, three horses pull uh, an implement which is even equipped with an engine. Um, and on the other side, there exist implements which were so simple and so well engineered that it could be pulled by one horse. Um, I agree. The working with was uh, shorter on the old equipment than on the new one. Um, but I come back what uh, Walter told us now before. Uh, efficiency per horse now um, was bigger on the old equipment than on the new one. And um, yeah, four cards are considered nowadays um, very often as, as modern. That's uh, a development which is uh, coming mainly from the US and most of the manufacturers here in Europe are copying equipment from the US. But this picture I found in, in archives, I visited uh, many times in, in Southern Germany. It's the archives of this uh, far company. And as you can see here, they were experimenting already in the 50s. This picture was taken in 1954 with uh, four carts equipped with donkey engines. Um, so it's, uh, it's nothing new. And I return to what I said uh, this morning. If we want to progress, we have to go back in the bygone time and see and learn from them and um, avoid to repeat the same uh, mistakes. Um, here you can see again this hay rake. Um, the original rake was built in 1947 by a company called Reposi, which still exists. It's nowadays run in the third generation. So it was the grandfather of the actual company, Elders who invented this rake. And um, here you can see the modern version of it. It's still built, it's still commercialized. Um, and we are currently cooperating with them to adapt their equipment to, to animal traction. The only thing we changed in the, the functional principle of, of this machinery is that we have adapted five raking bars instead of the original four, as it makes a cleaner, cleaner raking action. But for the rest, the implement is still the same. And yeah, here you can see it uh, hitched to one of our single horse four carts. And it was in 2013 when we invited both of the manufacturers because there exist two uh, manufacturers still in Northern Italy. Beside Reposi, there's another one called Minardi for some trials, some field trials to, to see how good their implements perform and to see how much draft effort they require. And these uh, manufacturers accepted to supply us uh, some implements and they joined us during a work day that was organized in Verona in Northern Italy. And uh, yeah, we did uh, these um, field trials. And um, nowadays, um, my friend's company, Ikedea, um, of Albano Moscato is supplying what we call adapter kits to this company. So usually people order the implements as a standard tractor pulled implement. And if they are interested in converting, uh, converting it into animal traction, they can order these kits and um, simply clamp it on the original implement so no weldings are needed or cuttings or whatever. And um, it's not a big market for these manufacturers. They built uh, about uh, 100 to 150 rakes per year. A lot of them are sold to South of America. Um, but um, nevertheless, between five and 10 are ordered for 
for animal traction. And here you can see the adapter kit for the Manadi rake. Here is the one for the Raposi rake. And here is a picture for a kit which we recently developed uh, for a smallholder in northern Germany for being used on a manure spreader coming from the US. Um, as he was not uh, satisfied with uh, one of these two wheel four carts, it pulled far too heavy for the small walking horse. He has it's a black forest horse. So uh, we did convert it into the single wheel concept um, with the same principle as I explained uh, just before, taking all the parasitic forces of the horse and uh, try to, to balance the, uh, the hitch. Um, yeah, a few words about the wheels. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, using ATV equipment is in our eyes not the right way. Just look back to the past. Every horse drawn implement in the past had this big wheel and they did know exactly why. They did not measure draft forces on each equipment, but they knew exactly why they had these big wheels on each implement. And what we found out with our measurings is something very simple. It's a simple, basic mechanical rule that the bigger the wheel is, the more torque it can um, transmit. Uh, and it's not the wheel which uh, defines the torque, it's the tool to be driven. If you put, for example, wheels on a ground-driven sickle bar mower, it's the sickle bar which defines the torque and the wheel has to supply or create this torque. And the bigger the wheel is, the less aggressive tra traction profile you need on the wheel and the less weight you need on the wheel. And um, if you compare, for example, uh, traditional mowing machines, usually a two horse mowing machine had a weight of 350 kilograms. The modern mowing machines available on the market run with 100 kilogram more for assuring the traction. And again, um, I have a little bit my doubts about if, if we can claim to be modern if we build such heavy equipment. And another reason for using big wheels on uh, horse on implements is if you run on a muddy terrain, um, the wheels don't sink in so much if the wheels are bigger. You have surely experienced this uh, already before with a wheelbarrow or another um, tool to be driven. And that's also something we, we could learn from the past. Um, and that was also a reason why they use these, um, these big wheels. Um, Yes, uh, that's just an example. One of our cedars, which we developed um, and the um, center of gravity and the center of load is exactly located in the wheel center. Um, nowadays, we are calculating the prices for for producing small batches of these implements in Italy, we have a lot of requests for, from farmers all around Europe for having new seeding equipment. I think mowing and seeding equipment is really what they are looking for. And um, a basic philosophy behind our NGO Schaffmat Pert, which is also the basic philosophy behind our project is never hide something. We publish everything we know or we think to know um, by our test reports or uh, by our guidebooks. We plan to, to publish next spring the third issue of our guidebooks about growing vegetables. Uh, the first two issues were about uh, harness and uh, hitches. And um, we are very happy that uh, these guidebooks are sold 
uh, either, either by ourselves or by the Rural Heritage magazine uh, from the US. And uh, we publish also our findings in the Small Farmers Journal, as I said before. We have the great honor that Lynn Miller is also with us today uh, for the next presentation. And um, finally, also in this uh, Swedish magazine called um, Moderne Hestkrafter. 